not just in Ireland, but right throughout the world, particularly uh, in the developing world. Uh, David Begg and I have worked together, not just in relation to labour and trade union matters, uh, he's only accidentally also a constituent of mine, but we also have worked together uh, with Irish NGOs to actually uh, bring uh, Irish aid, Irish development techniques, Irish partnership to communities in Africa. I want you to welcome David Begg, the fraternal speaker on behalf of the Congress of Trade Unions. Uh, Minister Joan, thank you very much indeed for your, your kind words. I uh, want to thank the Taunashta and the party for the very kind invitation to address conference on this historic occasion. When I arrived earlier in the afternoon, I met one or two residual people outside who were not entirely approving of my presence, but I did say to them that I do like to spend my Saturday afternoon with friends. So. <laughs> Uh, colleagues, the introduction of the Third Home Rule Bill in April of 1912 created the expectation of an Irish Parliament, and the trade union leadership of that time was alive to the possibilities that this offered for Labour representation. They would have been aware, too, that all over Europe, workers were founding social democratic parties to represent their interests. The period from 1911, beginning with the Wexford foundry strike and culminating in the lockout of 1913, was a period of intense industrial activity. It was an experience that brought home to the unions that workers have needs that cannot always be satisfied by industrial agitation alone. However, the immediate catalyst lending urgency to political action was that Ireland had been excluded from the, benefits, the medical benefits under the British Insurance Act. And so it was that at the 19th Irish Trade Union Congress, which was held in the Town Hall of Clonmel in 1912, James Connolly of the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union moved the key motion to establish the Irish Labour Party. And in the debate which followed, he was strongly supported by William O'Brien and by James Larkin. And the motion was eventually passed by 49 votes to 18, with 20 abstentions. A possible reason for the high number of abstentions was that the political allegiances of trade union members were then quite diverse. There were unionists from Belfast, members north and south who were loyal to the Irish Parliamentary Party and the cause of Home Rule, others who were more aggressively nationalist and some who supported Arthur Griffith Sinn Féin. The enduring nature of this political pluralism was to prevent the labour movement from reaching its full potential in the decades that followed as indeed it still does in some respects today. Competing forms of nationalism in the Republic resulted in every issue being conceptualised in terms of independence rather than of class interest. Social democracy therefore never took hold in quite the same way as it did in the other small open economies of Europe. The experience of these small open economies is that cross-class coalitions facilitate consensus building and economic progress but real social progress is possible only where there is a combination of social democrats and government working with a united and strong trade union centre. Connolly and his associates could see clearly why it was important for workers to have a labour input to public policy decisions. And in our time, today, this reasoning remains compelling. For example, it matters hugely that Labour moved immediately on entering government to reverse the decision of the previous government to cut the minimum wage. It matters hugely that Labour and government blocked the deconstruction of the joint Labour committee system. It matters hugely that social protection is in the charge of a Labour minister who believes in the concept of social justice. and who believes that there is a threshold of decency below no, which nobody should be forced to exist. It matters hugely that a Labour minister held out against the breaking up of the ESB. And it matters hugely, and let's be fair, that so far the Labour leadership has been able to prevent a complete fire sale of state assets, which would have happened otherwise.
It matters hugely, colleagues, that education is in the hands of a Labour Minister who believes in the integrity of the system and that it must be preserved at all costs to give our children a chance of a decent future. It matters hugely that public service reform is the responsibility of a Labour Minister who actually believes in the concept of a public realm. And it matters hugely to workers that Labour and government will work to ensure that when we emerge from this crisis, it will be to a new Ireland in which ethics and good corporate governance and not just accommodating legal advice will dictate the business practice. The intense industrial activism in the period between 1911 and 1913 was really about one basic human right, but one which was not secured by workers then or indeed since. But now, for the first time in 100 years, we at least have the possibility, I put it no stronger than that, but the possibility of achieving a legal right to collective bargaining. It matters hugely that work to workers, that the Labour Party not only campaigned in the general election on that issue, but insisted on its inclusion in the programme for government. But this, delegates, is very formidable progress for workers in a short space of time. It was achieved in difficult circumstances in which the priority of the government had to be the stabilisation of the economy. But over all this fine work looms the crushing, soul-destroying, morale-sapping and destructive pall of unemployment. And I would be failing in my duty here not to speak of it in a fraternal way to this distinguished gathering. The decision to conflate banking and sovereign debt, which Labour opposed when Joan was the spokesperson on finance, was a policy failure of epic proportions. The fact that the ECB was complicit in that decision and will not now take its boot off our necks to allow us to ameliorate that debt is, in my mind, reprehensible. Speaking personally, I do not expect much help from Europe. In my perspective, Europe is currently under the control of neoliberal ideologues who are quite willing to press their austerity dogma to destruction, our destruction. We are too small to matter to them. We are no more than an economic laboratory in which they can try out ever more extreme versions of policies that have already failed. And any notion of European solidarity for that crowd, for me anyway, dissolved on the streets of Athens. There is, delegates, a view that Keynesian demand management is not possible in current financial cir- or fiscal circumstances. It is an argument which has merit, certainly, but it is not the complete story either. To cut to the chase, we have to use our ingenuity to get investment into the domestic economy. And that is why we have proposed championing the idea of using some part of the $73 billion invested in private pension funds to build infrastructure. After all, that money is invested all over the world. Why not in Ireland? It will cut very little ice with workers here to tell them that their pension funds earned a fraction of a percentage more by investing it in Brazil rather than in Ireland if they have no jobs to retire from. Now, we are working hard together with Labour ministers, and I thank them for it, on this idea, and I believe it is imperative that we succeed. It is imperative too, by the way, that the pension funds themselves actually begin to wake up and see the big picture of what they are involved in. (laughs) Delegates, the Labour Party and Congress have separate mandates, which neither of us can surrender to the other. Yet these mandates are shared by a history a shared sense of struggle and a shared value system. And what are those shared values? Well, for a start, we believe that all human beings are morally equal, that all life chances should be as equal as possible, and that social justice is a condition of liberty. We believe that capitalism does not exist independently of society and that it is proper for the democratic will to be asserted over business and private power. 
You know, for an increasing number of our fellow citizens, their relationship with the labour market is becoming a very precarious one. Despite the glitz of modernity, a lot of people are as exposed as ever they were to some very hard brutalities. And they rely on us, all of us, you and me in this hall, to try to make life a little bit fairer for them. And in that respect, our mission is as relevant today as it was in Clonmel all those years ago. And you know, colleagues, when this current nightmare passes, as inevitably it must someday, we can use those shared values and those shared beliefs in social democracy to begin once more to imagine the future in its more promising terms. Thank you for having me.